Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. This is Dr. D. R. Mani's second lecture. In the first lecture, he had discussed about various strategies employed for data normalization. In today's lecture, we are going to continue the discussion about data analysis and especially the batch correction and missing value imputation. These two things are very important for any type of omic data analysis. Just because you can generate large amount of data set in a very very short time using mass spectrometry or NGS platform that does not mean that the data quality is very high. You have to be very cautious, very clear that what data you are analyzing and make sure that you do the proper ways of normalization, batch correction as well as the missing value imputation before you start further data processing. In this way, the batch correction removes the technical differences in the data, whereas missing values need to be imputed to get the better outcome. Sometimes you have to take a call, if there are many missing values in your data set, then probably that is not a good data, you need to trash the data and it starts all over. Or let us say you know if you have seen only very few places the data points are missing, but rest of the data is there, then software can utilize some resources, some you know ways of averaging and imputes the values to fill out those missing values. Again there is lot of statistics and considerations required what should be the, the way to do the missing value imputation, but that is what Dr. Mani is going to talk to you today in his lecture. He will also explain and talk to you about batch correction methods like Lima and Combat. On the other hand, he will discuss about the missing value imputation which is one of the very important considerations in the big data analysis. So, let us welcome Dr. Mani again for his lecture on batch correction and missing values imputation. So, the next topic in this set of slides is uh, batch correction. So, we just talked about normalization where we are trying to make all the samples similar. So, uh, I, I do not know how many of you have heard of batch correction, just a few. So, batch correction is something you apply when you think you have different batches of um, experiments you did and you think there might be a difference between those batches. So, you have uh, 15 TMT experiments you need to do, you did 5 in January, 5 in May and the remaining 5 in winter and you this is all one project and you had lot of vacation left over, so you were not there to finish all of them. So, now you want to put all of them together and uh, do an analysis. So, it is likely that the data you get from each set of 5 are going to be very different or significantly different. And that is because of technical variation, not because of biological differences in the sets of samples you used. So, correcting for that is called batch correction. So, let us say you have a scenario where you are looking at uh, uh, breast cancer, you got you have ER positive, ER negative and HER2 positive samples. So, you run all your ER positive samples in January, you run all your HER2 positive samples in May and then you run all your uh, uh, PR positive samples in December and now you have 3 batches again which have differences and there is big differences between what you did in January and what you did in May. Is it because of the difference between e e ER and PR or is it because of the batch? Answer? Yes, you can tell because the way you designed your experiment we can deconvolve whether it was because of the batch or whether it was because of biological differences. So, that is why statisticians say you always have to run a randomized subset when you are splitting things into batches. So, if you had ER, PR and HER2 positive samples in January you pick a, 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 a random subset of ER, PR and HER2 positive samples you put them in your 5 10 plexus and run it you do the same in May and you do the same in December. Now, if there is a big difference between January and May, you know because it is because of your batch, because there are ER, PR and HER2 positive samples in both sets and it is not a biological difference. So, that is why when you run experiments, you generally tend to uh, design them so that you, you lay them out and you uh, randomize the samples to the degree possible. 
Um, so if three people are working on a project, you don't want one person to be working on ER positive samples, another to be working on PR positive samples, and so forth. You want each one to work on a random subset of all the samples. So any distinction that is of importance to you in the biology, that has to be randomized. If you don't, if you have batch effects, you cannot separate the batch effects from the biology. And if you did your experiment correctly and there is a batch effect, then how do you deal with it? And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So uh, what I say, like normalization, batch correction attempts to remove technical artifacts in the data. But normalization is usually on a sample by sample basis, whereas batch correction is on a sample subset basis. So you have a group of samples that you ran at some point that needs, that, that resulted in some technical difference between some other group. Uh, so batch correction can be used to remove systematic technical differences. So different operators, different time of running it, different machines, different column you used for your LC, things like that. But as long as you have normalized, so you have randomized your data, you are in good shape. So you decided to run all your ER positive samples in the beginning of your study. They are doing everything in one week. But you decided to run all your ER samples on the first three days and then you're doing your PR samples on the next three days. And on day two and a half, your column got clogged and you had to throw it away. So now all your ER samples were run with the old column and most of your PR samples were run with the second column. There is a difference. Is it the column or is it biology? So you can't tell. But if you are alternating ER and PR samples and there is a big difference, you know it's your column. So that's the importance of like randomizing your uh, uh, analysis uh, when you're doing sample processing and uh, experimental analysis. So the thing is if you, if you have an internal, if you have a reference that you ran and you try to uh, use that to uh, minimize the difference, it would be okay for a pilot project but if you try to publish it, the reviewers will not accept it. So you have to have normal, uh, a randomized study and then do some sort of uh, batch correction. You can help the, if you have at least a, a same thing you ran across your study, you can maybe try to use it to do better batch correction, but it's not ideal. It's better than nothing, but it's not the ideal approach. If, if the question is whether the, a protein was different between type A and type B, so like cancer versus normal, a protein is different, you do it three times and you see the same difference. So in that case, you probably don't need batch correction because all you're doing is ratios of uh, uh, cancer to normal in the same batch. But if you are now, if, if you have three replicates, your statistics will be much more robust. So you can combine all the three replicates to find out which proteins are different. In that case, if there is a big difference between the same protein measurement in your different uh, runs, then your statistics will fail because there is way too much variation, your p-values will be very high. So in that case, it will help to have batch correction. So it depends on how you analyze the data. If you are looking at each replicate separately, drawing some conclusion and checking that conclusion across, you don't need batch correction. But if you are combining all your replicates and doing a unified statistical analysis, then hopefully you would have randomized your replicates. But if you didn't, you would do batch correction. You have only 10 samples that you can put on a TMT 10 plex and then you submitted it and the reviewer came back and said run it two more times. So then you can run it two more times, you don't need a reference. But if you are doing a study which requires 15 TMT 10 plexes just to do one or replicate of the study, then you would have a reference because you have to link the uh, different 10 plexes. So if you are, I think the rule of thumb is if your experiment will fit in one TMT reaction or one TMT experiment, you don't need a reference. But if it is going to span more than one, you should think about having a reference. In some cases, you, if there are like two or three tenplexes, depending on the conditions and the experiment, maybe you don't need it. But if it is a big discovery study where you have 100 samples and you need to do like uh, biomarker discovery or uh, proteomic analysis of all those samples, then you would have a reference. So what are methods we have for batch correction? I have a couple of methods listed. I, um, I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, but two common ones used are uh, LIMA is a package uh, that is used for a lot of um, uh, analysis. 
you can also use it for like differential marker analysis and so forth. It builds a linear like a two way ANOVA model and then uses that to do the batch correction and uh, there is a, a R package called lima and it has a function called remove batch effect. I will not go into the theory or details here, but uh, you, you can explore that and I think they have some examples and stuff you want to take a look at it. Another option is called combat. So, this is a, a empirical base uh, estimation of um, how to do the batch correction. So, Bayesian analysis usually is, tends to be more robust than traditional uh, frequentist analysis. Uh, so, it, this kind of uses a little more robust method, but this also has mechanisms that uh, make it robust. It uses what is called moderation, which is essentially another way of doing uh, uh, empirical Bayesian analysis. So, both these tools are uh, relatively uh, useful and you can uh, you uh, try both. They have differences that might make it more appropriate for one project or not. So, suppose you have two batches but one batch is more sacred than the other one. So, in your batch correction you want to take the second batch and make it similar to the first one instead of just putting the two together and correcting however. So, if you want to do that I think combat will let you do that, but lima will not let you do that. So, there are differences like that that might dictate which you want to use, but both are reasonable to take a look at. So, I think I have made this point multiple times. So, batch correction can obviously introduce artifacts. So, um, because of because of that I would not do batch correction unless there is proof that batch correction is necessary. So, you look at something and you say oh this set is very different from that set. If you can show that then you would go and do batch correction otherwise batch correction can introduce artifacts that might look like signal that might get rid of signal. So, you can get lot of false positives and false negatives if you indiscriminately use batch correction. And one example showing here is what I was saying the, uh, the experiment was not properly randomized and so one batch has more of one type of things than the other batch and when you do batch correction it looks like there is a differential signal because batch correction says oh uh, uh, this batch was one this batch was the second batch <coughs> and I need to go correct for both and when you do that there it, it the differences introduced could look like biological signal. So, here is an example uh, that Karsten worked on in our group. So, we had a experiment where there was RNA seq done from about 105 samples. So, those are the red samples. So, you can see this is plotting the, the um, expression value for all the genes measured using RNA seq. This is a box plot. So, you can see the first batch was all fine. There were one sample that was slightly low, but most of them were fine. If you look at the second batch, this one was new sets of samples, but it also had replicates from this set. So, things marked with a star underneath are replicates from this batch. So, you take the same sample from this batch and you run it like a year later, you can see how different they are. And um, so, the question is now I want to put these two together and do an analysis because I got new more samples when you have more samples you get more statistical power and so how do I do it now. And so, for that this is a case where you show there is a batch effect and without correcting the batch effect you can do the analysis. So, we do go and correct it and uh, once you correct they all look similar. And so, here is a, a example of how that looks similar. So, the, uh, the left side shows a hierarchical clustering hierarchical clustering groups similar things together. So, when you say here are all my samples, show me things that are similar and put them together. You can see all the blue ones which are the new batch grouped together, all the red ones which is the old batch grouped together and the green things in the middle are the replicates. So, even the replicates do not go together, they go with the batch. So, this is a very strong batch effect that overrides any biological signal you might have. And so, when you correct it you can see now that the reds and the blues are all mixed up and the greens actually line up, the replicates line up with each other. So, now after batch correction uh, a, a sample and its replicate are the most similar which is the correct uh, place to be not with the uh, uh, things in the same batch. So, we say that the after batch correction the batch effect has been removed and now you can do the analysis. So, that is kind of an example of where we used it. 
The next topic is missing values. This one I have a lot of slides, but I think many of them are technical and probably unnecessary. So I'll just uh, uh, zip through it quickly. <clears throat> so mass spectrometry is prone to more missing values than uh, RNA seq or uh, most of the genomics methodologies. So in in uh, like 10, 15 years ago, if you used an affymetrix microarray to measure a sample you would get a measurement for every single gene. There would basically be no missing values. But in proteomics, there's, it's not possible because proteomics is stochastic. You are measuring things that fly in a mass spectrometer and what flies once may not fly again. What flies in one sample may not fly for another sample. And so you're, you tend to see a lot more missing values in proteomics. To make this worse when you're doing phosphoproteomics, which is really the interesting part of proteomics, because you can look at signaling and kinases and how they work. The uh, phosphocytes may be present in one sample and completely absent in another. So maybe some pathway is activated in a subset of your cancer samples but is not activated in all your other samples. So the phosphocytes that represent the activation of that pathway will be present in like some small subset of your samples but not present in all your other samples. And so you get a lot more missing values in phosphoproteomics. When you try to do statistical and machine learning analysis, many of the tools need all the data to work. If you have missing values, the, the algorithm cannot be applied. And so the question is, how do you deal with missing values? So in statistical theory, there are three types of missing values. In increasing order of, uh, I guess, a worry index. If you are in the first one, you don't need to worry about it. You can throw away the data and you'll be fine. So that is called missing completely at random. So randomness is very important. If your data is missing in such a way that it, the, uh, the things that are missing are completely random, then they're not going to affect your biology. And so you can say, okay, fine, I don't care. I'm going to throw it away. I have 200 proteins that are completely missing at random, then I can just ignore it. The second part, missing at random, is that the missing value depends on some part of the observed data. So for an example here is peptide intensity is missing based on characteristics of the peptide. So if the peptide has a specific amino acid, it's missing. So here, so if, if the peptide has a specific amino acid, at random times it's missing, it's not always missing. So there, you know the characteristic and once you know the characteristic, then the missingness is random. Because which sample it's missing is, is random. But if the sample has a specific uh, amino acid in that peptide, then it's likely that it might be missing. But whether it's actually missing or not is random. So in that case, it's called missing at random. So these things you have to be a little more careful. You can't just like throw it away. Uh, but the most worrisome part is missing not at random. And unfortunately, all proteomics data, most proteomics data is missing not at random. Missing not at random means the missing value depends on the missing data. In other words, it's missing when the value is some specific thing. If your intensity is less than some count, the data is missing. So that is missing not at random. And so that is the most worrisome type of data. And there, you have to be very careful on how you deal with it. You can't just like casually throw it away. But it's also the hardest to deal with even in, with statistical theory. So I'll just go through like a pragmatic approach to how to deal with this. I will not go into all the, the details of, of, of what we do. Uh, we don't need that. So here are some uh, approaches that people use to deal with missing data. So one is called complete case analysis. So this is you throw away any data that is missing and then you do your analysis. So if a protein was observed in 95% of your samples but missing in the 5%, you throw it away and then you do your analysis. So this loses a lot of data. And in phosphoproteomics, this may not be a good thing because you will lose a lot of your signaling peptides. Um, you may lose a lot of your biomarkers too, in, in, even in the proteomics data. So you want some other method. So one way is, uh, throwing away things that have a large proportion of missing values. So that may be reasonable. So in other words, if you have something that is missing in more than 80% of your data, 
you can say that is way too much, I do not want to deal with it. So, you if a protein is missing in more than 80 percent of your data, you do not look at it. That makes sense because uh, statistically there is not much you can derive from looking at a small set and also you do not know how it is different in the others and so it may be okay to um, uh, drop variables that are missing. So, in the analysis we do, we have a relatively high threshold. I think if the data is missing in more than 70 percent of the samples, then we throw that away. So, we take a protein, if that protein has not been observed in uh, 70 percent or more of the samples, we throw it away. Uh, we, so, if we start with 12,000 proteins and we apply that filter, about a few hundred the maximum 1000 proteins will get thrown away. So, it is about like uh, 5 to 10 percent of proteins generally fall into that category. If you look at phosphoproteomics, the number is larger, it is more like 25, 30 percent, but still it is not that big a number and it is a reasonable thing to do in most situations. So, the other thing to do is impute the missing data. So, you can say, okay, I do not want to throw away things that have missing data, my analysis method needs the data. So, what can I do? So, one thing you can do is you can say, I am going to carefully figure out what the value could have been or should have been and then fill it in. So, that is called imputation. So, you can impute missing data and then complete your data set. For that there are several methods, the best ones use some sort of a machine learning model. So, they look at all your data, they look at things that have been observed for the thing that is missing and then they kind of predict the missing value should have been this by looking at the entire data set. So, it builds a machine learning model by looking at the entire data set and then comes up with a, a, a imputed value for data that is missing. So, we have found that the, there is this method called k nearest neighbor imputation uh, that works reasonably well. There are couple of other machine learning based methods that also work well. So, if you really have to fill in, so the way we do our analysis, we, we start with the full table, we apply the threshold. If it is missing in too many samples, we just throw it away and then for the remaining, we use a k nearest neighbor imputation to fill it in to do the analysis. There are some analysis methods that can actually deal with missing data. In those cases, we do not uh, impute, but if you are using a method that cannot deal with the missing data, we impute using k n n or some machine learning based method. So, before you do a marker analysis, you should not use the information of the classes for making any decision because if you do that, then you are biasing your analysis to the groups that you know and you should not do that. So, you would look at the entire data set. Let us say your perfect biomarker is present in your uh, uh, cancer and not in the controls and so you are you have 50 percent cancer, 50 percent controls. If you set this threshold to be 40 percent, you will throw away all your biomarkers. So, you would set the number to be high enough. So, let us say you set it to be 70 or 80 percent. So, then you retain things that are present in only a few of the, the cancers, but are missing in all the normals and maybe even a few cancers. Then you will keep those markers. When you do k nearest neighbor implementation, remember it is called k nearest neighbor. So, what it does is it is going to say, okay, I need to fill in this protein for this sample. I am going to find samples that are similar and find what values they have and then fill it in. So, it is going to look at other control samples and then fill it in. But if there are, if it was missing in all the control samples, then the, uh, the imputed value will not be that, that clear. But if some had some small values because of noise or something like that, then it will just average the noise and create a value that will fall into the noise. But if it was missing in the tumors, then when you look for similar samples, it will find more tumors and then it will fill in with the value that is specific to the tumors. But so, this algorithm will actually correctly take group into account without knowing about the group. It does not have to be actual technical replicates, but you need biological replicates for the same group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you had two samples and it was missing in one, there is not much you can do to fill it in the other. But if you had 100 samples and it was missing in 5, you can use the other 95 to fill it in.
So, I hope today you have learnt about what is batch correction and how to perform this kind of analysis. You also learned the important strategies of batch correction which is lemma. The design matrix is used to describe comparisons between the samples. For example, the treatment effects which should not be removed. The function in effect fits a linear model to the data which includes both batches and regular treatments then removes the component due to the batch effect. Another method for batch correction is combat which is robust as it can do a model based adjustment to remove the artifacts. The batch correction also need to be done correctly otherwise a wrong strategy may lead you to the artifacts. So, next important thing is the missing value imputation which you have heard. This is you know one of the common facts people see in the various experiments especially the mass spectrometry uh, based data generation. Whereas, sometime you know some values you cannot see for every single protein and what should be the considerations to impute these missing values is very important. Again as I mentioned in the beginning that you need to ensure that missing values are not too much in your data set especially not more than 70 to 80 percent otherwise the data is not real you should try to uh, not use the data set at all. If there are only very few missing uh, data points then you can utilize the missing value imputation strategy to try to recover that information. The different type of missing values like missing not at random M and AR or missing at random MAR as well as missing completely at random or MCAR of which the last one MCAR is commonly used for the proteomic data set analysis. You also heard the k nearest neighbor model based imputation which is a preferred a statistical analysis with missing values when compared to the mean or median population. We will continue our discussion about different strategies employed for data analysis and the lecture will be continued by Dr. D. Armani in the next lecture. Thank you.